It is just after 6 p.m. on January 10th, 2023, and this is the City of Iowa City um, uh, formal meeting. And I'm going to ask for roll call, please. <clears throat> Should have did that first. <laughs> Alter? Here. Fergus? Here. Dunn? Here. Harmson? Here. Taylor? Here. Teague? Here. Thomas? Here. All right. Well, welcome to everyone that is in the audience and also those that are on social media. Um, and we want to actually welcome our newest counselor, Andrew Dunn, who was just uh, appointed earlier today. And we'll just give a round of applause of welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. We're going to go on with our agenda, which item number two is proclamations. And the um, Proclamation 2A is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Whereas the Reverend Mar Dr. Rob Martin Luther King Jr. believed that each individual possesses the power of self-fulfillment, regardless of their circumstance, and that is the duty of all human beings to strengthen communities, alleviate poverty, and harvest the potential of all of us. And whereas Dr. King's dream of transforming the world into one free from discrimination and intolerance continues in the mind of millions and has not been forgotten since his devastating death on April 4th, 1968. And whereas Dr. King Jr. dedicated his life to promoting peace, freedom, and opportunity through nonviolent means, and whereas the teachings of Dr. King can continue to guide and inspire us and address and challenges in our communities, and whereas there are numerous ways to show service and respect to others, such as volunteering at your local hospital, donating books and games to families in need, organizing a food drive in your school, volunteering at a senior center, and many others. And whereas the city of Iowa City joins with other towns and cities across the country in tribute to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., now, therefore, I, Bruce Teague, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim Monday, January 16, 2023, to be Martin Luther King Jr. Day in Iowa City and urge all to join me in the celebration thereof and to take this opportunity to reflect upon Dr. King's message of the principles of justice <coughs> and equality for all. And to receive this is uh, our Human Rights Commissioner, Roger Lucella. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Iowa City Council, for this uh, proclamation. I'm here today representing a group of people that serve on the Human Rights Commission and uh, to accept this on behalf of all the work they do as well to better our community. My favorite quote by Dr. King is, the way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. The teaching of Dr. King's continue to guide us and inspire us in addressing problem that we see in our community today. The question usually is, what can I do to keep Dr. King's dream alive? So I have 10 simple things we can do to keep Dr. King's dream alive. Uh, befriend someone different than you. Someone who does not look like you, talk like you, live like you. It doesn't have to be that complicated. Number two. Pay attention to social issues in our community today. Find the one that makes you pause and do something about it. Do not ignore community issues that make you uncomfortable. Face it. Number three, serve others. That's all we are here to do. Number four, lead by example. Number five is have faith in humanity. That's what a lot of our nonprofit are uh, represented here today do on a daily basis. Number six, diversify your reading list. Diversify your movie list. Diversify the places you eat, the places you shop. Read a book by a black author. Watch a movie by a black director or black cast members. Visit a black-owned establishment. We have plenty in Iowa City here. 
Number seven, be an ally. Don't just say you are, actually be one. Number eight, support organization that advance equal rights. We have many in Iowa City. Find the one that feeds your soul. Number nine, practice inclusiveness in your everyday life and the places you work or play. And number 10, volunteer and give back. Those are the way we can advance and keep Dr. King's life, <coughs> our dreams alive. And for Martin Luther King's Day on Monday, we have a great event taking place. We invite all of you guys. Uh, we're gonna have a unity march starting uh, East Day Plaza at 9.45. We're gonna walk all the way to Mercer Park where they're gonna be all kinds of activity and uh, speakers from our community leaders and the leaders in our uh, black community. So we invite you all to join us and there'll be food. Supervised porters cooking, walking tacos. So you are all invited. Thank you very much, Council. Thank you. So could I get a motion to approve our consent agenda, items three through eight? So moved, Taylor. Second. Second. Sorry, go ahead. Moved by Taylor, seconded by Burgess. All right. Would anyone from the public like to discuss a topic that is on our consent agenda? Or either on person or in online? All right, council discussion. Roll call, please. Dunn. Yes. Harmson. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Teague. Yes. Thomas. Yes. Alter. Yes. Burgess. Yes. Can I get a motion to accept correspondence for item 8A? So moved. Done. Second, Fergus. All in, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7 to 0. All right. Uh, community comment uh, time. This is an opportunity, which is item number nine. This is an opportunity for individuals within our community to come up to speak about any item that is not on our agenda. You'll be provided up to three minutes. There is a sign-in sheet that we ask people to sign in. And um, when you um, address your comments, please state your name and the city you're from. Welcome. Hi, my name is Brandon Ross. Uh, Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Dunn. I uh, supported you in your previous run. And if I had another rhyme, I would use it. Uh, I would like to reiterate points uh, that I think are important for this, uh, this coming year. Uh, one would be uh, increase affordable housing. Uh, I think that we don't have enough. We have something called a housing market. Nobody knows what it is. Uh, landlords can just ra raise rent to whatever they want, and uh, the city has usually very little to say about that, but I'd like that to change. I would like the homeless shelter uh, to be expanded, the program for the homeless shelter. I think we can do better. We have too many homeless people. Our economy is not great. Uh, homelessness is growing, so that's a good thing to do. Um, I would say that uh, transportation could be increased, uh, Sunday transportation. I mean, people who, who don't have cars, and that's a lot of people, uh, they can't get around. So if they have jobs and things like that, they can't get to them on Sunday, and that's an economic uh, problem. They should have the right to be able to do that. Um, and to encourage uh, further uh, transportation use, uh, kiosks are very helpful and benches. Uh, if we can fit it into our budget to make uh, a bus stops a little bit more livable, uh, people are oftentimes out in the cold or the very hot, and they're taking a bus. You know, those who are healthy in the middle years are usually good, but the elderly, uh, the handicap, uh, those people need to have access. And then handicap accessibility could always be improved. Uh, the man who came before me and spoke has said some beautiful things, and I couldn't possibly even approach uh, what he was getting into when it comes to Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, who I'm honored to say went
went to the same university as I did. Boston University uh, was one of his places. Um, I would say that Martin Luther King, when I like to think about him, I think about some of his last speeches and, and his, uh, his speeches against the Vietnam War. He was against that. He believed that basically wars in general uh, did not help the people. They, they helped the oligarchs, those who had the money, and people made money like today our, our military arms industrial complex makes money like Raytheon and Boeing and uh, they, they just make hand over hand no matter who we go out to and Dr. King was very pointed about this. He was not soft spoken in this area and I respect him with all my heart in this area and, and with this in mind I would like to please uh, encourage people to write your Congress people and the President uh, to call and demand negotiations uh, for a war that is very dangerous that's going out in Ukraine. Basically what you have is a nine-year civil war, eastern Ukraine versus western, and now it's the U.S. versus Russia. Please do contact. Also, about reading new books, I got one. How the West you. brought war to Ukraine. Thank you. Please read this. It's 90 pages. I'm taking a few extra seconds. I'll, I'll let them back sometime Thank later. You. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Anyone else like to address council? Hi, council. Welcome. Um, so just a couple announcements. Uh, the university will be starting its spring semester next Tuesday. And also, uh, the student government this semester will be going to the Iowa Capitol to meet with representatives and help pass the renter's checklist. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And if you can just state your name for the record and the city you're from. Keaton Zimet, Iowa City. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Um, I'm Pam Michaud. Live uh, in College Green Historic District for 32 years. And um, I've been thrilled to note three houses have changed ownership out of the 16 in the last few years. There's young blood and families with actual children. And the third but not least is the Catholic Worker House that moved next door uh, at 113 South Johnson across the alley from my house. Very welcome because they provide uh, needed housing for recent immigrants from any source, but generally uh, they seem to be uh, devoted to Central American refugees. So unfortunately, there's no one in the house that is bilingual. So I can't be a good neighbor and take stuff over there. <laughs> um, and they don't have COVID shots. But anyway, um, what has changed in the last year from rental housing is that the directors of the Catholic Worker House have expanded their mission to the thir a third of Eastern Iowa. So as of the last three and plus weeks, over Christmas, over blizzards, people have driven a two-hour commute or two-hour distance from Wapolo, Henry, Louisa, all kinds of counties far away to have uh, English assistance to apply online or in paper for COVID relief checks. Some of these people have been very hard workers at Tyson and those kinds of food companies. They deserve the checks, but when they come from a long drive during a blizzard, you know, when the chill factor is 20, 30 below, they need a parking space and they don't have it. So they're looking desperately for, where do I park? This is supposed to be a public facility. It's not, it's an office, converted a house converted into an office now. So um, as of my count, there were at least 50 applicants per day for the last uh, 15 days, uh, at all except Christmas. They've been running all except Christmas. So um, the director uh, that helped purchase the house and got donations, that's fine, but they need to respect the neighbors that have been there for a minimum of 32 years, up to 57 years. And so 
just having a historic district doesn't mean you're special, but it is a residential neighborhood. Some rentals, but not offices. And I would urge um, planning and zoning to have a little bit of accountability here as far as enforcing uh, zoning issues because we all have rights. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address any item that's not on our agenda? Anyone online? All right, seeing no one, we're gonna move on to item number 10, which is planning and zoning matters. And I will um, go with 10A, zoning code amendment, solar and climate action ordinance. This is an ordinance amending title 14 zoning code to enhance land use regulations related to solar energy systems and further climate action goals. I'm gonna open the public hearing. All right, and we're gonna welcome Danielle Stitzman. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Danielle Sitzman, Neighborhood and Development Services. This is a zoning code uh, amendment before you tonight. Um, as a little bit of background, just to walk you through how we got to this uh, point with this amendment, just a refresher, which I'm sure you don't all need, but the city has an investment in, uh, through its comprehensive plan and multiple other plans over the years in climate action, adaptation, and addressing uh, energy and energy use. Um, the most recent uh, study was a solar feasibility study that Johnson County the Johnson County Clean Energy District presented to staff, um, encouraging the city to take yet again another look at our solar ordinances to make sure that we're doing everything we can and nothing that's uh, making uh, implementation of photovoltaic solar uh, energy systems uh, difficult here in Iowa City. So what you have before you tonight are the proposed code changes um, based on a re-review of our current ordinances, basically trying to make sure that what we are uh, encouraging is clear in our code language and, and not a barrier to installation of photovoltaic solar, both in residential uh, situations and commercial. Uh, as I said, this is not something new. Um, the city does allow solar, has for quite some time, has taken a look at our solar ordinances over the years. This is yet just another uh, chance to take a fresh look at it through the eyes of others. Um, our current regulations basically re regulate those systems as mechanical systems. It's not the clearest way to state something. If you're gonna go look in a code book for help, if you're a homeowner, you're probably not gonna type in mechanical systems. I want a mechanical system on my, on my roof. So we were trying to be more transparent, use wording that was more common, and really make it clear that we were encouraging solar in every way that we could. Uh, you may recall uh, in 2019, we had another uh, code update addressing utility scale, ground-mounted solar, not rooftop, but things that were um, operating more as a utility, very large in scale, um, and generating electricity in that way. Um, we do also have a streamlined process already in place in our historic and conservation zones, basically allowing for a staff <coughs> review instead of a historic Preservation Commission review in those instances. And if you go back a little bit further in time, uh, we uh, streamlined our building permit process to standardize that with the way um, other jurisdictions are um, reviewing and permitting solar systems. So as I said, these amendments are really um, pretty minimal. I'm just trying to add and clarify definitions, limit any regular barriers to solar energy that we have and provide, in addition to those two things, some additional incentives to encourage solar where we can. As far as the definitional changes that I mentioned, they are fairly minor. They're just adding actually the wording solar energy systems in a lot of ways to make the code more searchable, explaining that's what we meant all along by mechanical structures. That hasn't, we think, been a real um, detriment to people who have made applications. It may just not have been as inviting as it could be for folks who were considering this and just couldn't find themselves in the code. Um, as far as removing potential regulatory barriers, um, these are things that we were not uh, blocking solar in the past, but it wasn't perhaps as clear as it could be. Um, the solar systems didn't need to comply with maximum heights, that they were considered integrated into the building by simply being on the roof. Um, removing some of the wording about screening requirements, um, obviously you don't want to screen the sun away from a solar array when you're wanting to encourage that. Um, removing the concealed from public view requirement for roof-mounted solar. Um, 
if you can recall far enough back, solar was kind of a new and different thing um, when it first was being implemented decades ago. Anymore, it's more of a normal and customary thing. And so a lot of the code language was maybe put in place in the very early days of addressing solar and no longer needs to really be there. It's not something that um, is a negative externality for neighborhoods to have and what, as I said, the city is really looking to encourage. Um, we did also add some minor um, modification uh, language that allows for additional flexibility for review of truly unique and odd circumstances if they should come up. The minor modification process is a process that already exists in our code for uh, changing some zoning standards in just a little bit of a way, depending on what they are. We do that with setbacks and heights and some other things. So this is just adding solar to the ability to request a minor modification from staff if they have a particularly unique circumstance that needs another um, look at it. Also, it includes the prevention from private covenants, deed restrictions, um, from restricting solar in neighborhoods. Oftentimes, a homeowner will find out the city is perfectly okay with their solar array, but their homeowners association has language um, that would block that. This wouldn't be retroactive, but would work on any new um, covenants uh, going forward. As I mentioned, we also wanted to include voluntary regulatory incentives to encourage solar for folks who are maybe not thinking about it, or when they are thinking about it, it doesn't pencil out dollars-wise. Um, we wrote in some incentives allowing additional density and reducing parking, knowing that both of those things uh, either help the bottom line or remove a cost. Parking is a cost, and so if we can offset some costs, those costs can be invested into solar instead. Um, the packet does include some examples of how that would work out. There's a series of bonuses that can be acquired uh, depending, depending on the system. So we think this addresses gaps in the city's code, makes it clearer. Um, there are some potential trade-offs for the fee and loose system, but we really took a look at things that were marginal and we thought would have a, be a good trade-off. Um, so overall, this is an amendment if we've considered it to be consistent with the city's comprehensive plan and the city's climate action goals to reduce carbon emissions. Um, as this is simply a zoning code amendment. It's coming to you from the Planning and Zoning Commission tonight. Uh, once adopted, uh, we would simply apply this to our existing permitting uh, processes. So based on a review of the relevant criteria, best practices, and consultation with the city sustainability staff and the Johnson County Group, um, staff does recommend the proposed code amendment to enhance the land use regulation related to solar energy systems and to further implement the city's goals related to climate action. At their December 7th meeting, the Planning and Zoning Commission concurred with staff's opinion and voted 6-0. Happy to answer any questions. Just a quick question, Daniel. I had heard, sorry, over here. I had heard once that um, you couldn't install solar panels on the side of a residential roof facing the street because they were visible. So does the, the language that says solar panels are exempt from this, would that take care of it? Right, that would. Okay, thank you. Dan <clears throat> Daniel, I had one, one concern I have, and uh, hopefully it can be quickly answered uh, is is on the um, providing the regu regulatory incentives. Uh, will they in any way, um, I'm not quite sure how to put it, but you know, we have, we, I think I, we're, we want to try to incentivize affordable housing, you know, with say like uh, eliminating, potentially anyway, eliminating parking minimums when we're, we're looking at affordable housing units. If we provide uh, such waivers for, you know, solar, is there any conflict with that? I mean, you, you only have certain number of parking spaces one can waive. If they're waived for solar, that seems like it might conflict or at least potentially conflict with waiving them for affordable housing. So there's only so, so many levers we can pull, and we've pulled that lever for affordable housing. I guess uh, it's the same lever we would be pulling it for a developer that might not choose to do affordable housing, but might choose solar. So uh, we're never going to get everything with one thing, but we want to make it as another option. Uh -huh. So yeah, eventually uh, parking will be something that <laughs> is no longer as an effective lever to pull, but I think every development could be slightly different in what they're trying to accomplish, and so a commercial uh, uh, not residential, but a commercial business might choose the parking reduction for solar and they wouldn't have that option for affordable housing. So uh -huh. it's just another option. Hearing no other questions, thank you. 
Would anyone from the public like to address this topic? If anyone is online, now is the time as well to raise your hand online. All right, before I close this public hearing, Council, are you inclined to vote with PNZ? All right, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Could I get a motion to give first consideration? So moved, Burgess. Second, alter. Council discussion. I greatly appreciate the cleanup for uh, searchability. I think that's glad we're being aware of that kind of thing. Yes. yes. And updating <laughs> to make it so, to, to reflect better that norms have changed mm -hmm. as well. So I encourage, or I'm, <clears throat> I'm pleased that it's um, encouraging an incentive for uh, the, the affordable housing aspect of it too, um, that, that that's an option. Um, and solar, we've been trying to encourage developers to uh, be in line with our climate control um, plan, and I think this will this will help that. Roll call, please. Harmson, yes. Taylor, yes. Teague, yes. Thomas, yes. Alter, yes. Burgess, yes. Done, yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Item number eleven is convey sanitary sewer easement. Resolution approving the conveyance of a private sanitary sewer easement to Metro Pavers, Inc., adjacent to Lot 1, Metro Pavers, first edition. I'm going to open the public hearing and welcome Jason Havel. Good evening. Jason Havel, city engineer, uh, here to give you a little bit of background for this item. So for those of you that are not maybe not familiar, this site is located on Southgate Avenue, the west end of Southgate Avenue between Gilbert Street and the river. Uh, Metro Pavers has gone through the subdivision process. They're looking at a proposed building on the site. With that, there would be a sanitary sewer service as well as a water service that would be needed for that, which is typical. Um, and often what happens is those are extended from the building into the right of way where they tie into the city's main. Um, and in the drawing here, you can see that's exactly what's happening with their water service. So they're going from the building to the existing water main that's located within the Southgate Avenue right away. What makes this site a little bit unique is that you can see the right away, which is that dashed line that sort of encompasses Southgate Avenue, ends just west of their driveway. And the green line in the green dot is our sanitary sewer and a sanitary sewer manhole. And that extends just west of the right away onto private property, but in this case is a city lot. And so in order for them to tie into that manhole, which is where we would like them to, to tie into, and it's, it's typical, um, they would need a easement from the city to install that on city property. And so that's what is in front of you is an easement to allow them to tie their private sanitary service into our sanitary sewer main. As we look at this area, uh, this is an area where we anticipate that in the future, the right of way would be extended uh, likely for a, a cul-de-sac or other turnaround in this area. Um, the, this property also already has existing easements on it, um, so it really shouldn't be any issue to, to add to that. Uh, but because of that, uh, you know, and I guess the other thing I would point out is once this does become right of way, that easement would go away because we don't have easements in right away. It would be uh, an allowed use at that point. So uh, because of that, uh, it is proposed not to have any fee charged for this easement to but basically just to to grant them the easement to allow them to install this sanitary sewer service. So that's what I got. If you have any questions, happy to, to answer those. This is a really basic question because I recognize it on the inset but where specifically is, what buildings are those? So Not the proposed, but the actual, the pro where the proposed, is that the 3M? No. So are you asking kind of where that location is at? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just like, I'm completely yeah, so, discombobulated. Um, this lot actually goes, there's kind of that, I call it a small lake area there, just east of the river. Uh, uh, that The lot actually extends all the way up to Highway 6 behind Hills Bank and that kind of thing. Okay, yep. gotcha. Yeah. Thank you, it just, Sure, sure, yeah. I was not acclimating myself. Thank you. <laughs> Hearing nothing else, thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone from the public like to address this topic? If you're online, please raise your hand and we'll acknowledge you. Seeing no one, I'm gonna, before I close the public hearing, is council inclined to vote with on this? All right. 
I'm going to close the public hearing. Could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, Burgess. Second done. All right. And council discussion. Roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item number 12 is discrimination against Section 8 tenants. Ordinance amended in Title II, entitled Human Rights, Chapter 1, <laughs> entitled General Provisions to Eliminate the Pro Prohibition on Landlords to Discriminating Against Housing Choice Voucher Holders. And this is second consideration. Um, could I get a motion for a second consideration, please? Can I get a motion for a second consideration? So moved. Oh. Moved by Burgess. Second by Alter. Seconded by Alter. Oh. All right. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one. Council discussion. <coughs> Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I think this is, from a purely logical standpoint, I think city staff and uh, our city attorney's office has done a wonderful job of identifying things that legally, because of the action in Des Moines, that we cannot, um, we cannot enforce this that's on our books. Um, and, you know, it's very clear from our earlier discussions that everybody on this council is in support of having um, the ordinance being enforceable, although we don't have that power. Uh, because the world isn't always a purely logical place, I find myself, the more I've thought about this and just understanding we're now at an inflection point where we might see some landlords decide to yank um, housing for people. Um, we're at that point in time where they're starting to be able to. I just don't feel comfortable supporting this at this time, although I realize it's just a symbolic act. I wish it was more than that. Um, but I think maybe that symbolism does have some value for the people who might be in the coming, hopefully not, hopefully this will be a moot point and we'll find out that it's a moot point. But, uh, but if somebody, a family is seeing that, I just hate having, even though it's symbolic and it logically makes sense and it doesn't actually have an impact, it just feels wrong to me. So I will not be supporting um, this particular one this time around and, and that's my reasoning why. I will say that this certainly isn't something that I feel um, happy to, that's before us. And as you mentioned, the state has kind of um, made it mandatory um, where cities don't, uh, landlords uh, have the right to not accept housing vouchers. And while none of this council um, supports, you know, mm -hmm. this action, um, I also believe that, you know, we have to uphold the law um, you know, on some levels, I think there's other ways to um, try to help individuals within our community, although, you know, <laughs> it, it becomes a challenge um, when you're talking about uh, landlord, their desires, and what the heart of this uh, community needs, which is more affordable housing. So because this is the law, and I recognize that really there is nothing that we can do um, against this. I will vote in favor of it, but I um, I wish this wasn't before us. Amen to that. I raised a similar objection during the first hearing um, with a question as to you know would this potentially have any. Um, hold any difficulties for us and um, city attorney and uh, city manager themselves reluctantly but clearly explained why this could become problematic and so uh, Sean I applaud you and I agree with you um, I think that for us to have a the clearest path in terms of what the city's position is in accordance with the state as it's mandated I'm not okay but okay with supporting it simply for the, the for the the running of the city in the way in which it needs to as a point of clarification the the thing is the state mandate is we can't enforce it but there's no law that says we have to change our code 
at any particular point in time, is there, or, or am I misunderstanding that? No, you're right. I mean, the state law indicates that any such ordinance uh, would be unenforceable as it relates uh, to the housing choice voucher subsidies. Um, and and so that's why we were uh, surgical in removing just that mm -hmm. and leaving in all the other anti-discrimination provisions in the ordinance and so forth. My, my concern, uh, as I articulated uh, at the last meeting when this was discussed, but perhaps for the benefit of uh, Council Member Dunn, was that, uh, you know, years from now, uh, it might be the case that we've lost some institutional memory or knowledge that uh, that this provision currently on the books, if it were to remain on the books, is unenforceable, and we would thus give some answers um, to members of the public indicating uh, that it is enforceable, and that could create some problems for us and, and potential liability for us, and, and so uh, that's one of the reasons why I think it would be uh, best legally to clean it from our uh, from our books. And I think that makes real sense. I think one of my concerns and my fears is, and I think the idea that this could cause confusion down the road is, I think you're, you're almost certainly correct in that analysis. My confusion is right now because we're at that inflection point that if we repeal this as a council, it will cause confusion in the other direction. And if, God forbid, there are landlords that are willing to kick poor people out on the street, I do not expect them to be the kind of people to in good faith explain who allowed this to happen and they'd be more than happy to throw us to the wolves so to speak um, you know say that we, this is something we did and there'll be stories about the fact that the council passed this which there should be um, and uh, well, I'm sure the stories will explain the nuance of this decision which you're all completely correct on I'm thinking this is just not the right time um, I would be absolutely happy to uh, you know think about this more between now and the third reading and maybe even think about pushing this off a little ways until we see exactly what happens here in our community. Now that this is like, uh, the new law just took effect nine days ago, 10 days ago. Um, I just think it's it's real close and, and by, well, being proactive on this is like, normally I would be 100%, I mean, I am applauding that, like our city staff being on top of this. I think that's that's admirable. And I just think this is a unique situation where we could be seeing some people in dire straits and I do not want to confuse them thinking that we were in favor of what's gonna, what could potentially happen to them. My hope is a few months down the road, we're gonna have a much clearer idea of how this change in the law is going to impact our community. And at that point in time, if there's no problem, then I'll have no problem. Um, that's, that, so that's what I'm coming, and I think sure. by the way, you, those of you that are supporting it, I think you're doing so for all the right reasons and, and your reasons make sense to me. I just, like I said, I just can't personally go along with this at this time. I will say that there has been, you know, some uh, information about this out there, both with landlords and with some renters. And the renters is very clear that this was a state. I mean, these are some immigrant individuals uh, that very clear that this is a state thing, that this is not a city um, um, desire. But we unfortunately have to fall under that um, that law. So while I do understand your fear, I don't believe that that it manifests um, in a great deal, not to say that some people won't misunderstand it. And those that are advocating and helping individuals um, with any of this type stuff, uh, they're very, I mean, they're very clear on saying this is a state thing and, um, and realizing that it's the law. So um, that's why I feel comfortable um, you know, uh, folding forward and yeah. So I just wanted to at least make a statement there. Any other comments? I'd just like to express that I I, uh, I think I'm falling in the, the uh, same place as Councilor Harmson. Um, from from the you know conversation that we've had here, I think I'd be more comfortable in waiting um, and I don't plan to support at, at this point. What about just simply deferring on this, um, if, if the idea is to, to wait? I, uh, I mean, is there, in other words, is there an urgency in us making a decision on this now? If, is, Councilman Harmson, you're, you're just thinking it's something you might support in, in the near future, or? Well, I mean, I think when we see what the reality of the situation is, we just uh -huh. don't know. It's just, like I said, this change happened in the law 10 days ago. Um, you know, I just feel more comfortable kind of wait and see how this shakes out a little bit before we before we move on this. Um, maybe in the meantime, you know, we do have other initiatives we are doing, which is important for the public to know, to look at things like our rent, you know, looking at things with our ARPA funds and our strategic plans to so hopefully find some other ways to make 
help people stay in their fa their homes, even if they are on rental assistance, maybe um, some you know support for reluctant landlords, some, some assurances. So we are working as a city, and it's important, again, I say this for the public record, that we are looking at other alternatives to try and help our families as this state law, new state law takes effect. I'm just this part of this because of the language and because I think the timing of it is just, makes me uncomfortable and I think that, you know, we aren't, nobody on this who wants to vote but yes for this is doing anything wrong because it's just cleaning up based on state law. But I think that right now it could be confusing and harmful um, and create, can, can create some confusion if we see a lot of people losing their homes at this time. I'm hopeful that that does not happen, that that does not manifest. And in six months, I'll be like, this doesn't seem to be an issue that, that we actually have. We now know we're a few months in. We had now have some idea. And I, I know I will feel more comfortable at that point, assuming that we don't have a, you know, a, a bunch of people discovering that they will be losing their homes simply because they are in need and need to use Section 8 vouchers. That's, that's, that's my concern. Like I said, everything else about this, I totally get it, totally makes sense. Everybody's coming from, you know, staff and council members that support this coming from doing the right thing on every other respect except for this one that, that sticks in my craw. Um, it sounds like maybe we it, there could be a motion for a deferment, and I would suggest if there's a uh, motion for deferment, I would put out a suggested date, September, <laughs> somewhere, in September, our first uh, meeting in September would be that date. First meeting in September? First meeting in September of 2023. That gives kind of the six month and actually beyond the 8-1 move. Right, I was gonna say beyond the, the midsummer lease mm. um, shift that happens, which it's a whole nother issue, but <laughs> but yeah, that, that the date would make complete sense to me and I think we would have a clearer picture that I would be either firmly in, in support or firmly against it at that point, just by knowing what kind of what the situation is here on the ground. Um, would you like that in the form of a motion, Mr. Mayor? Yes, we would need a motion. And then the date, if someone has a calendar. September 5th. September. <clears throat> Did you say 5th? September 5th. You're like uh, Mayor Throckmorton. He always <laughs> knew the dates. <laughs> well, I'm happy to put forth a motion that we defer <coughs> this the September 5th series of hearings and uh, decision until September 5th. I'll second that motion. Okay. Moved by Alter, seconded by Harmson for the discussion. I will just make it make mention that the next item is not related, although it may seem like it is, but um, it is it is two different beasts, or two different <laughs> items. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Mayor. It, we I, I think I heard a motion in a second to defer to yes. a date certain of September 5th. Did I miss the vote? Uh, we didn't. No, we we had, we had discussion after the motion. motion. Uh, no, that would just be a voice uh, voice vote. I was afraid okay. that you were moving on to item 13. I just wanted yeah. to make sure. No, no, okay. no, no, no. Sorry. No, no. So we're just having discussion. Okay. Any other comments? All right. All in favor of deferment, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes to defer until September 5th, seven to zero. Could I, um, all right, we are on to item number 13. Repeal of rental permit cap. Ordinance amending Title 17 and Title Building and Housing, Chapter 5 entitled Housing Code to repeal the rental permit cap provision. Staff is requesting expedited action on this item. I move that the rule requiring that ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived, and that the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. Move by Taylor. Second, Thomas. Seconded by Thomas. Anyone from the public like to discuss uh, this item? Say no one in person or online. Council discussion. I, think I might as well just go ahead and step in it again. Um, <laughs> the, the reason I actually, because this has actually now been in effect for a couple of years. Um, unfortunately, this ability was removed from the city uh, a couple of years ago. It has been in place for a while. I don't think that the, it's some of my concerns with the last one about confusion and, and where this is coming from, you know, that, that period of time has elapsed. And so, so I will be supporting this one. 
um, because it accomplishes all those goals, which again, I, I agree with. Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Could I get a motion to pass and adopt? So moved. Done. Second. Alter. Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Item number 16, amending the budget the budgeted positions in this, oh, what did I say? Oh, 14, I <laughs> flip pages. All right, item number 14 is CPRB ordinance, ordinance amending Title Eight and Title Police Regulations, Chapter Eight entitled Community Police Review Board to clarify a person who observes an incident on social media does not have the request uh, personal knowledge to file a complaint. And this is a motion to give first consideration. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Taylor, seconded by Alter. Anyone from the public like to discuss this topic? Seeing no one in person and no one online, council discussion? I just think um, this makes uh, common sense uh, that, that we would uh, require that uh, rather than having a bunch of folks who've seen it on social media and, and profess to, to have knowledge of it. Agreed. Well yes. Roll call, please. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 15 is ARPA Shelter House Housing Stability Pilot Program. Resolution authorizing the mayor to sign a state and local fiscal recovery fund grant agreement with Shelter House to administer the Housing Stability mm -hmm. Pilot Program. And could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, done. Second, alter. And welcome Tracy Heishu. Oh. <laughs> I'm trying to get the slideshow. My buttons are not working. Just the sign in? It's right in the middle. Okay. Oh, sorry. Mm. No, close it up. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you can tell I'm not an IT wizard. Uh, all right. Thank you. Um, Tracy Heishu, Neighbor and Development Services. Um, excited to be here tonight to, to talk about the Shelter House Housing Stability Pilot Project. This is a great continuation of our work that we've done with local funding streams and our CARES CDBG funds to address housing stability. This is an ARPA-funded project or proposal. It also addresses the eviction prevention under the ARPA category of emergent needs. Um, as you can tell, the request is for 1.13 million. Chrissy Canganelli from the Shelter House is also here to answer any of your questions. Um, a little bit about the project itself. It, there's three main components. It is a three-year program. Um, right now, the, well, the first one is coordinated entry, and this is a critical piece um, for us. They're funding, right now they're funding it locally. Those funds will run out. This will continue that coordinated entry piece for three more years. We rely on um, our housing choice vouchers. A lot of our programs are by wait list. Our mainstream and emergency vouchers are not. They're by coordinated entry. It's that continual care process where they staff and they make the, they interview clients, they take the phone calls, and they, uh, with a bunch of community service providers, determine the right level of housing intervention and make those referrals. This position will continue that for the three years. Um, the second part is the housing stabi stabilization services. So they'll hire two FTEs to continue to stabilize services. Um, the housing na navigation portion works with tenants uh, to locate and secure housing. So anything that you need to do, arranging uh, to see apartments, working with the landlords, um, they'll start RentWise again, which is a program that helps um, renters have success in all aspects of the rental experience. They'll offer eight courses annually throughout the program du duration. The program is not mandatory, but it is encouraged for all recipients. And both with activity number one and activity number two, these services are offered all for residents of Johnson County and Washington County. The last piece that I'm really excited to, to talk about is the landlord risk mitigation. We have had this in our plan since 2016. This actually implements this um, th this fund. So you budget in your affordable housing fund 30,000 a year for risk mitigation. We've not been able to utilize this fund for this purpose until now. So what Shelter House will be doing is they will provide this this fund. So 
for those clients that they're working with, and they might have different housing barriers, whether it's criminal history, poor landlord, um, rental history, whatever it is, it assures the, the landlord that they're working with that if there's excess, excessive damages, loss of rent, or legal fees beyond security deposit, that they can tap into this fund and will pay for up to $3,500. We'll review this annually, since I said it's a three-year program, and hopefully at some point we can expand this to all those, um, with that, all those landlords who accept ho our housing choice vouchers. This program is limited to Iowa City households. So be, since, since your affordable housing fund dollars, um, you'll have to be an Iowa City resident to take part in that. The last component is the eviction and prevention and diversion program. So this continues all our efforts to not go down that path of eviction. They'll hire two FTEs. Um, those, those, those specialists will work with applicants to apply for funds, to apply for op, um, different programs. They'll work with the coordinated entry specialist to get people housed. They'll provide that landlord-tenant education that is needed. They'll provide more outreach to landlords. They'll utilize the rapid rehousing funds to relocate households. Um, this is also a continuation of their work with Iowa Legal Aid. During the pandemic, they started doing legal aid clinics at the Johnson County Courthouse to prevent evictions. So this continues that for the three years. And they'll also subcontract with Iowa Legal Aid to do those expungement cl clinics. Um, those are the three aspects of the program. Like I said, all of it will, will benefit Johnson and Washington County residents. Only the landlord risk mitigation funding, funding will be limited to Iowa City residents. And I just wanted to to note that the city is providing these services through a one-time allocation of ARPA funds. So while this project serves Johnson County and Washington County, once our three-year funding commitment ends, um, to continue that level of service, we will need to approach other municipalities and other jurisdictions about continuing funding this program so that we can, that we can continue on beyond our, our pilot project. And at that point, I think Chrissy Iyer can answer any questions that you might have. I think I have questions just related to ARPA funds. So one, I think this is a great opportunity for our greater community, but for ARPA funds, um, it was my understanding that ARPA funds have to be used on Iowa City residents. When we talked about the you know, the, the partnership that we went in with the county, it was at least my understanding that we couldn't do ARPA funds outside of the city. So I want to... No, I think yeah. th there may be a difference, Mayor, between like a direct assistance program and, and really funding services. If you think about all the nonprofit grants we've done through, um, through ARPA, um, some of those services may be accessed by non-residents as well. Um, I think this is in that in that same spirit, a um, little different than a direct assistance we, where we'd be providing direct financial assistance to, to someone outside of our community. We can confirm, but it's the same thing with community development block grant. When you're talking about a public service as opposed to a direct benefit, you can provide, we, we fund all of our nonprofits knowing that they serve um, the county. So in, that federal program allows it. We'll confirm it, but I believe what Jeff is saying is correct. Hmm. Okay. Tracy, I had a question about the Landlord Risk Mitigation Fund. You said that the hope would be to expand it to all the Housing Choice Voucher recipients in the future if, if it could be expanded. Can you just give us a sense of the scope of the current eligibility for the first three years, um, like number of people that would serve compared to adding in the Housing Choice Voucher recipients? Housing Choice Vouchers without the Emergency and Mainstream Voucher, you're talking about 1,200, 1,300 households. Um, the people that are eligible for it, well, let me get back to that slide. So Shelter House, initially when we, when we start this program, they s assist any landlord that's going through our rapid, that are getting rapid rehousing dollars, mainstream emergency vouchers, permanent supportive housing, nonprofits, with support of housing. Christy, you have any idea? I'd say about 500. Okay. So it'd be a big expansion. That was my question. Okay. We're waiting to see. So you allocate, right now it's 30,000 because mm -hmm. you allocated a million based on that distribution formula. So each year when you go through that budget process, we would allocate another, let's say it stays at 1 million. Every year during that three years, they get 30,000. Mm -hmm. um, we're hoping that we don't go through that a lot, <laughs> that that fund money stays in there. Um, so after tonight, 
shelter house can request that funds and they'll administer that program. We might use our inspector, so like if there's a claim for damages, we go out there just to inspect to make sure that it's a valid, the, the cost estimates are reasonable. So we'll commit some of our staff to doing that, but the referral is gonna come out from Shelter House. Their properties would be eligible, so Cross Park Place and 501 would be, um, would be eligible. However, if those claims, the city has to verify it just for transparency. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was going to be my other question was how do we know these are sort of legitimate claims? So I They have to be verified. That. So yeah. when um, Chrissy will have that education with all the nonprofit housing providers that when they're placing tenants um, between our HQS inspection or they'd have to take photos so we can mm -hmm. make sure that the damages are done after they got in. Um, and then we have sent somebody out to verify those damages. Great. So all damages have to be documented. Thank you. I'm not sure I'm going to phrase this very clearly, so bear with me. Um, it sounds to me like, based when you were talking about eligibility, that these dollars essentially are their, uh, let me start over. Do you have identified landlords that you're working with, or this is really based on those who have need, like the tenants, and then you're working with I'll let Chrissy answer landlords that. to to see if you can incentivize those landlords, or are there landlords who are a priori saying, "Yep, we're in on this"? I think I finally got my question out. Sorry. For risk mitigation. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so for risk mitigation, the uh, proposal is that it be any landlord that's collaborating with us, partnering right. with us, and okay. renting to these households. Um, if there is a need in excess of um, the security deposit that they would be welcome to reach out to this fund. So it's not necessarily the tenant, but it's the landlord. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I guess I was just wondering in really basic terms, are there landlords identified who would be part of this pilot project? But it sort of sounds like it's a little bit working a little bit more fluidly than that. It's about sort of your network of landlords. Right, so the first phase of our implementation of this is actually marketing this resource to those landlords, but it is, as Tracy said right now, this component of the pilot is only eligible to those landlords that are in Iowa City. Um, so any, any entity, any landlord that's renting to these households, uh, we would be reaching out to them and telling, about, telling them about this new opportunity. And that's kind of part of phasing in this first year since it's so, so there's an educational component mm -hmm. to it. Have you found, I mean, it, it seems, the, the existence of this piece seems to indicate that there is a need for it. So you, even though you already have a network of landlords who would be working with people who would be need lower barrier, um, and entrance into housing, they still might have um, some hesitations. So there's uh, definitely a benefit to having this as a okay. resource. Um, as the preceding conversation about um, allowing to discriminate uh, based on the source of using housing vouchers as a source yeah. of, so, uh, you know, from time to time, landlords had a bad experience with someone that either we have recommended through rapid rehousing or someone that has a housing voucher that we're working with. And if this is kind of that additional buffer to incentivizing them to rent to the next household, um, it's just really helpful for us. Any tool that we can add to this kit to continue to incentivize landlords. And also those tenants that um, me, we may be presenting, potential tenants that do have backgrounds, um, bad credit histories, bad rental histories. This is just something else that we can offer as a potential benefit to their taking a risk where they ordinarily would not have. Thank you. And that's all data that we wanna be able to collect and then present also and going forward to you know, argue for continuation of it and in what degree. Does that make sense? Any other questions for staff? Thank you. Or the shelter house. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Seeing no one. Um, anyone from the public like to address this topic? If in person, please step forth. If online, raise your hand. Seeing no one, council discussion. Well, I'll jump right out there. <laughs> so 
Um, what I'll say is there's, I mean, I can go a lot of ways with this as far as, um, as a, you know, person that is responsible for shepherding over the city funds and, and how do we, um, really meet some of our strategic plans and, and all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, um, I can go through the budget and kind of nitpick and that type of stuff. But at the end of the day, for me, um, if I truly believe that housing is a human right um, and we have to get to a different level um, within our community, even though there is certainly funding beyond, um, one would argue, um, people would be recipients of this program beyond Iowa City residents. Um, I think because of that belief that housing is a human right, I'm going to support this, even though I can go through and kind of make arguments for it needing to be a little more um, city focused. Um, because 1.1, 1 .1, <laughs> you know, million is a lot of money that we're talking about uh, from our ARPA funds. So I'm going to support this because I really believe um, housing is a human right and we need this partnership with the shelter house to get us to a different level and this will be just one avenue that will help combat the 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 um this complex it's very complex housing is complex uh this complex uh challenge that we have and uh, you know our strategic plan talks about housing you know a lot and so i'm going to support this yeah it does we do focus a lot on housing and it, it, it does have so many facets to it. And uh, I think it's, it looks to be a very well designed program. Um, I like the pilot aspect of it. It sort of gives an opportunity to tweak and refine and learn from the process as it kind of unfolds. So yeah, you know, kudos to everyone working on this. It's a really great program. I like that it is um, working through incentivizing rather than it being, you know, the carrot and the stick model. Um, I think for a very long time in terms of looking at housing and there's a, a real impulse to say you need to do this and so do it without there being much what's in it for me. And this, um, this allows for sort of more of a partnership um, component, albeit, you know, yes, cash on the barrel head, but um, it really is about saying there's a benefit. You will have your units occupied. We think it's worthwhile. And I think that over time, that incentivizing model can have a lot of benefit overall about how people understand, developers, landlords, et cetera, understand the need for a range of different models for housing, particularly affordable, because certainly a re more restrictive one has not proven to work all that well. So I like this very much. Thank you. I would uh, echo the thoughts of other counselors and also just point out, I think, something that was already said. I think it functions as a um, good response, a positive response to, um, you know, actions of state government, uh, you know, incentivizing people to potentially get rid of uh, people who are lower income and struggle with housing affordability. So I would, I would support this as well. I support this also, especially since it um, funds the full-time employees because, as we all know, the shelter house has its hands full with, with its basic duties as it is now. And so uh, to have persons particularly responsible and being paid uh, to um, overshadow this program is, is helpful. All right. Roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Motion passed to seven to zero. Now we're on to item number 16. <laughs> 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 Amending the budgeted positions in the support services division of the police department, civilian accreditation manager. Resolution amending the budgeted positions in the support services division of the police department and the confidential administrative and executive pay plan by adding Point five FTE civilian accreditation manager position grade 24. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So, so moved, Don. Thomas. Moved by Thomas, seconded by Don. And we're going to welcome Chief Liston.
Good evening, Mayor and Council. Dustin Liston, Chief of Police. Um, the Iowa City Police Department has been accredited by CALEA, which is the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies since 2002. We've received seven accreditation awards. We're in the middle of our eighth. And that position, uh, the duties of keeping us accredited is currently assigned to a full-time sergeant. He has a couple of other duties, but he's going to be retiring in a couple of weeks. And if you remember in 2020 on the city manager's plan to uh, restructure the police department, the one of the plans was to civilianize that position, to create a part-time civilian accreditation manager. And this is just requesting permission for that position. Any questions for the chief? Hearing none, thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? And uh, if you're present, please come forth. If online, seeing no one, council discussion. Well, I'd first like to compliment you, Chief, and I know it was previous uh, to your uh, assignment to that position, but the, the seven accreditation speaks a lot for, for your department and how well it's been run and, and how they've uh, functioned in our city. Um, I foreshadowed some of this on Saturday in our discussions, but um, I'm not going to support adding a halftime position in the police department. I appreciate the the need to centralize the the, the duties into a civilian position, um, but I still am looking for the shift and not uh, increasing the overall budget. Roll call, please. Done. Yes. Harmson? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? No. Motion passes six to one. Item number 17 is amending the budget of positions in the Support Services Division of the Police Department Lieutenant Position. Resolution amending the budget of positions in the Support Services Division of the Police Department by deleting one full time sergeant position, grade 29, and adding one full time lieutenant position, grade 30. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, done. Second, Alter. And we're going to welcome Police Chief Liston back. Thank you. Dustin Liston, Chief Police again. Um, this is in line with the last item. The sergeant that we're replacing with the part-time uh, accreditation manager, we'd like to change that position to a lieutenant position, and that person would become the professional standards position, which would in essentially be an internal affairs investigator. The current process for internal affairs for the Iowa City Police Department is incoming complaints get assigned to a watch commander who is in charge of a shift of officers he does the investigate he or she does the investigation and then forwards it up the chain of command those investigations are very time consuming can, can take upwards of 50, uh, 40 to 60 hours and while that person is doing that they're not really able to supervise their shift as well as we would prefer them to be able to. So this will clear uh, them up to supervise their shift as well as provide a little consistency in the process. It'll be one person that will do, be doing those investigations. And I think it'll really add the professionalism of the position. Here are no questions, thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? If so, please raise your hand online or come forth. Seeing no one, council discussion. I just want to um, lend support to this, actually, because um, one of the things that I know has uh, been talked about before I came on to council, and that was, a, a, um, and continues to be an incredibly important um, point of contention and of tension um, in public and police circles, is about um, mentoring and getting um, police training that they need and support um, so that they are you know making right decisions and so I think that apart from the fact of having a centralized investigatory internal affairs person um, which makes a lot of sense to me that to allow the supervisors to actually oversee their shift which as you mentioned there's been a lot a lot of new hires in the past, couple of years, some who have experience, but more who are less experienced, that having that kind of more hands-on um, ability to help work with younger um, officers, I think, is incredibly important. And is, while it is still functioning within the police department, it is trying to help shift some of the <coughs> psychology and some of the um, 
approach to policing so that people who have less experience can perhaps make better decisions. Um, and so I'm in favor of this position to allow for the shift supervisors to do what they should be doing. Yeah, I see this as an opportunity for um, some of those investigations and complaints that, you know, is kind of now going to one person who isn't trying to do double jo double jobs, <laughs> you know, in a way, um, really does lend opportunity for greater um, conversations, greater opportunities to get to um, some interactions that really do change the dynamics of um, some of the things that this community want within our de police department. And so I do support this because I, I think it is that move forward. While I know that um, there is a lot to be said about um, what the what we would like to continue to see as far as the more of the civilian opportunities within our police department, but I think that this is critical for just keeping those um, professional standards and expectations of this community uh, in line. Here another no other comments. Roll call, please. Harmson. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Teague. Yes. Thomas. Yes. Alter. Yes. Burgess. No. Done. Yes. Motion passes six to one. Item number 18, Police Department Mental Health Liaison, resolution approving and authorizing the Merida Sign Agreement with Community Crisis Services for Law Enforcement li Liaison Support. Motion to, could I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, so moved done. On. Second, Taylor. All right, moved by Don, seconded by Taylor, and we're gonna welcome Police Chief one more time. Best and listen, Chief of Police. Um, this is, we already have an agreement with community t that provides us with one mental health liaison. This is uh, another agreement that will just expand that, expand our coverage to two. Um, it, it's in line with one of the strategic goals. Um, and by 2028, you all identified a goal of getting 24 seven coverage with our mental health liaison. So this will double it from one person to two. So, and again, we would make sure they're working different hours. So instead of eight hours a day, five days a week of coverage, we'd have 16 hours a day, five days a week. And by, by 2028, we hope to be able to have 24 seven cover coverage, but this is a step along that, uh, along that journey. Any questions for the chief? Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one, council discussion? I can't talk highly enough about this and I'm very much supportive of it. Uh, I was one who um, talked about the need for our awareness of mental health issues and which has led to uh, our work session topic in February. It's just vitally, vitally important here. Hear, I hear on the news all the time or through the grapevine about um, the suicide rate in, in the community or just mental health issues, persons out there uh, that need help. Um, and it, it's, it's time that the discussion come literally out of the closet, so to speak. It was such a under the rug and people just didn't talk about it. It was such a terrible thing if, if a relative or someone you knew had mental health issues. And, and it's time that we do talk about it. And uh, our state has not been helpful for funding for it. And so I'm, I'm just really proud that our city will, will uh, fund this and I approve of that. I, I fully support this as well. You know, I, I don't think it's a secret that we have some of the worst mental health, uh, I guess, environment for care uh, in the entire United States. And uh, I think in line with the strategic goals, this does a, a good service to our community in, in, in addressing that concern. I've been really grateful to see the work that Joa, the current uh, mental health liaison, has been able to do in um responding to some of these calls with, with our officers. I do have a question about budget impact for, I think probably for Jeff or, or for the chief. Um, this is previously budgeted funds. This is not an addition. There's no additional budget impact, correct? Correct, and uh, we've secured 25% funding by the state too, as well for the position. Thank you. Re recording in progress. <laughs> a little late. <laughs> yeah, no, All right. right. <laughs> um, Progressing. Uh -huh. Any other comments by counsel? Hearing none, roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Alter? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. 
Motion passes seven to zero. All right, we are on to items number 18, which is council appointments. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. We have about five appointments, I believe. Um, and so we will take them one by one. Uh, so the first one is gonna be the um, Board of Appeals, item ni number 19A. Board of Appeals, one vacancy to fill a five-year term, January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2027. All right. And this is no, um, no gender balance and there was only one applicant. And he, um, <clears throat> I would approve of him being reappointed. He's currently on it, and he fits the qualification as being as far as being part of the Home Builders Association, which is one of the requirements. Mm -hmm. So I'm fine with Andrew Martin being um, reappointed. I agree. I think um, just as because he did have a full term before, um, but this is probably one of those um, boards where we don't have a lot of applicants. And so sometimes we do reappoint. <laughs> well, we often reappoint to a second. Often for a term second term anyway. Yes. So we often. Well, I think uh, my experience is we often reappoint if someone didn't serve a full term. That's for sure. Yes. We also <laughs> but but we in all. certain, com I mean, it varies in certain commissions, and you know where we don't. I think we try to, I'll use the term spread the love a little bit. Um, <laughs> the service love. Right, right. The service love, yes. All right. Now we will, at the end, we'll kind of do each together if that's acceptable. All right. We're going to move on to 19B, which is Housing and Community Development Commission. Housing and Community Development Commission, one vacant city fill an unexpired term upon appointment through June 30th, 2023. <coughs> and. Um, there is uh, no gender balance there. And we do have some people that applied. I would nominate Kieran Patel for that. I would support her. I would go along with that. Uh, also, I've, I'm familiar with her with some other um, boards and commissions and, and items that she serves on and she is always in attendance and she follows through on, on assignments and I, I just think she would be a good fit. I, I echo that. Karen's an incredibly hard worker, know her well. Any other nominations? All right, Karen will be it. On to item number 19C. Library Board of Trustees, one vacancy, one, Library Board of Trustees, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through June 30th, 2027. And we have, um, I think, five applicants there. No, yeah, five. And no gender balance. I um, liked what Joseph Massa, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, had to say about being an advocate for public library systems, uh, <coughs> that it's an essential resource uh, for our community uh, and uh, has immense value for community. I, I just liked what he had to say and he had a couple of uh, preferences, but the library he said was his first choice, so I would recommend him. Any other nominations? All right, Joseph Massey will be that nominee. On to item number 19D, Senior Center Commission. Senior Center Commission, two vacancies to fill a three-year term, January 1, 2023 through December 31st, 2025. And there is a gender re um, requirement 
and it is two males and one nun. But we have two vacancies. Oh, that's right. So we have, um, yep, so we'll have to determine um, who will do kind of an unappointment vacancy. Um, and then we have this January 1st through 2023 through December. They're all really upon appointment, but we'll have to designate which one it would get the nun, I guess. If it happens to be a female, we'll have to get the nun. So how do you want to proceed with that? Um, I think we'll just take nominations, and um, certainly you can nominate more than one female, realizing at the end there can only be one female. Um, there has to be two males. One of the people I was just re-familiarizing myself, so apologies for the pregnant pause there. Uh, but one of the people that I actually do like is, um, oh my goodness, uh, Ast Nancy Astrog Astrogni. She uses the Senior Center. She's been a mar member of Parks and Rec, um, Johnson Seats Commission. Um, she has experience in ADA matters. So that's someone that I think would be good. I think Susan Melliker also looks like they would be a good fit. Um, and been active in the senior center before, a uh, good amount of leadership experience with uh, things. Yeah, I, I gave her a little bit higher mark um, on that one. I would um, recommend Warren Paris. He's uh, well known in the community, been in the community a long time, and um, I think he would be a good fit. Any other nominations? We think we need one more. One more, one more male. <laughs> well, I, I had Jay Gilchrist as I, someone I as. I did too. Me too. Okay. Any other nominations? All right. We have um, two males, which is required, and then one none. And we have Susan and Nancy that's been nominated. Um, so I guess the question is, um, where, do we have support for, how many would support Nancy? You can probably just throw your finger up. I, mean, I nominated her, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I and, would support her. And who would support Susan? Yeah. All right. So Susan, um, help me, uh, Melliker? Melliker. All right, Susan Melliker. Um, we'll get that. All right, I think we are ready to submit our Thanks. nominations. Where are you plugging those? Yes, thank you. All right, so um, where do we want to do the, let's see, do we know? So the, the people who left are all, they're female. So how does that work <laughs> if it's a male I requirement? Two males. I wondered that too. What do you, um, oh, I see what you're their saying. Their terms expired. Well, and I think what she did, because there's also under the new 
two more vacancies. So I think we were taking uh, into uh, account because it's a, a, a female and a male that have resigned on the new. Okay. I understood this. We we had uh, the two males could be 19D, and uh, I thought I understood 19E to be had to be the female. Yeah. So Susan would be 19E. The, the unexpired term, right? That makes sense. Too. 19E. Okay. All right. So we're gonna go with 19E. Um, the unexpired term will be Susan, mm -hmm. and then. Um, Warren and Jay will be 19D. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to give this a twirl. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've. Could I get a motion to appoint the following to Board of Appeals Andre Martin, Andrew Martin, and for that would be 19A? And then for 19B, Housing and Community Development Commission, Karen Patel. For 19C, Library Board of Trustees, Joseph Massey, Massa. For 19D, Senior Center Commission, the two vacancies would be Warren Paris and Jake Gilchrist. And then for 19E, Senior Center Commission, upon appointment through December 31st, 2023, Susan Melliker. All right. Can I get a motion? So moved. Andrew. Done. <laughs> Second, Burgess. All right. Moved by Don, seconded by Burgess. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes, seven to zero. On to items number 20. Announcement of vacancies new. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. Senior Center Commission, two vacancies to fill an unexpired term. One vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through December 31st, 2023. And one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through December 31st, 2024. Applicants' applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, February 14th, 2023. Can I get a motion to accept correspondence? So move. I'll move Taylor. Moved by Taylor, seconded by Burgess. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Item 21, announcements of vacancies previous. Applica applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. Airport Zoning Commission, one vacancy to fill a six-year term. Board of Appeals, one vacancy to fill one vacancy for a licensed plumber to fill a five-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, East College Street, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Historic Preservation Commission, Jefferson Street, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, Woodlawn Avenue, one vacancy to fill an unexpired <coughs> term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. City Council information is item number 22. So this is an opportunity, um, Andrew, where we just give any uh, reports on various meetings attended, upcoming meetings, community events, and items of interest. I'll start. Um, I'll, I'll just like to elaborate uh, on what was said earlier when the proclamation was uh, read for Martin Luther King. Uh, he briefly touched on the events and uh, having attended before, it's, it, I'll, I'll share your uh, awesome and amazing uh, word phrase because uh, it really is uh, a great event uh, starting, starting off uh, at 9.30 at the um, uh, Eastdale Plaza. Uh, by the where UAY is on the south end of it, They're, they'll start there, and the Brave Souls will walk from there to Mercer Park, which is a great. It's uh, it's it's uh, called the uh, Unity March and Community Celebration, moving the dream forward. Uh, so that march is, is a lot of fun, and then they make it over to um, Mercer Park, uh, which uh, 10 o'clock starts off with some guest speakers and singing and poetry and dancing, uh, as well as uh, free food as they had 
Meg mentioned, uh, uh, cooked by Roy St. Perter. And if you haven't ever had her food, it's it's amazing. Um, and, and that's really a great event. And, and I, what I've heard, which is a good way to phrase it, is that the kids are off school that day. And it's, it would be a great thing for, for families to come out, bring their children, and utilize this as an educational experience rather than the kids maybe just sitting at home and, and doing their little iPods or whatever they do these <laughs> days, uh, come out and um, uh, have these uh, activities and entertainment. It's, it's a great event. And then uh, <clears throat> ending out the afternoon at 2 o'clock uh, at the Bethel AME Church, uh, which is on uh, 411 South Governor Street, uh, is, is a great event. Uh, if you've never heard the Bethel AME Choir, uh, and I know the mayor can speak to this too, and, and then also the East Union Mennonite Choir, wonderful, wonderful music, and there'll be speeches and, and uh, uh, a lot of great uh, uh, entertainment, and that's that's a good event too. Two o'clock, uh, then at the Bethel AME uh, Mennonite Church, and with in conjunction with the Mennonite Church. So try to attend those events. I will just add that is absolutely a great event to attend, but um, there are uh, other opportunities to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, celebration um, with through the city of Iowa City. We have Human Rights Week, um, and you can visit mlk.uiwa.edu, and you'll see a slew of events. They started actually on January 6th with uh, UAY. Um, uh, having an event that was really geared uh, programming for the middle aged to high school students uh, to come uh, to the public library and, and, and have opportunity to learn over there. Um, and then there's opportunities for speak, sing, act, and dance. That's going to be January 13th, um, where performers can register at um, IC, Iowa City Public Library. Um, but on our website, if you go to that link, you'll see just an array of events that is just a great opportunity for our community. I will just mention that um, Monday, no, Tuesday <laughs> through the following, I think, Sunday, um, I will be in Washington, D.C., um, so I'll be at the mayor's, um, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, um, uh, Tuesday through, I think, Thursday, and then Friday through Saturday at the Mayor's Innovation Pro uh, Project, um, representing the city of Iowa City. And this will be my fourth time attending. Yes, one was virtual. <laughs> well, the mayor is going to show me the ropes with the uh, innovation conference because I'm going to be joining him for that latter part. So, yes. very exciting. If no more announcements, we're going to move on to I item number 23, which is report on items from city <coughs> staff. And we'll start with our city manager's office. Uh, just a reminder that you have uh, another budget meeting. If you didn't get enough on Saturday, we're back here at 2 o'clock tomorrow for the capital improvement plan. Yes, yes, great. Our city attorney. Uh, nothing for me tonight. Thank you, Mayor. And our city clerk. All right. Item number 24 is adjournment. Could I get a motion to adjourn, please? So moved, Taylor. Second, Alter. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned and welcome Andrew.